RCC family, it's so good to be with you this morning. And if I don't get the chance to tell you before you leave today, happy Thanksgiving. I hope you have a great day on Thursday. In fact, I hope you get to eat as much turkey as you want, nap as much as you want, watch as much football as you want, buy as many Christmas presents for me as you want on Friday, right? But I, I hope you have a great day on Thursday. Thanksgiving has always been uh, my favorite holiday, and so I'm really looking forward to being with my family on Thursday. But I've also been looking forward to being with you as my spiritual family this morning as we just get together and open up His Word. And so Matthew 6 is where we're going to go today if you want to open in your Bible there. And we are just going to continue looking at this prayer that we find from Jesus here in Matthew 6. We know it is the Lord's Prayer. And we're just going to keep talking about how we live this prayer out. And so we're going to take a look at a line in Jesus' prayer here this morning where he kind of states the obvious, all right? And so Matthew 6, we're going to start at verse 9. And look at what Jesus says. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Now here's what we're going to focus on this morning. Look at what Jesus says. He says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So Jesus kind of states the obvious here, doesn't he? Because we need forgiveness. I mean, we have these sins because we're sinners. And so we need this forgiveness. And Jesus, in his prayer here, he calls our sins these debts. So in other words, when we sin, there's this debt that's created between us and God. And it's a debt that we cannot pay. We cannot pay off this debt on our own. And so what ends up happening is when we sin, it separates us from God, right? Like because we're sinners and because we sin, we make a mess of this father-child relationship that we have with God. And so we need his forgiveness. And by the way, I want to make sure you notice that in Jesus' prayer here, he doesn't say forgive us of our debt. He says forgive us of our debts, plural, right? And so how do we live this out? Like how do we live out God forgiving us for our sins? And so that's what I want to take some time and talk about this morning. So when you came in, if you grabbed one of our bulletins on the back, there's some uh, blanks that you can fill in. You can take some of your own notes if you'd like to do that. Uh, you can also do that in the RCC app if you want to do that there as well, all right? So let's just spend some time talking about this this morning. How do we live out being forgiven for our sins? First, I think we need to receive forgiveness. We need to receive forgiveness. Over and over in the Bible, it's clear that God forgives us for our sins, but I think there are some of us maybe who have a hard time believing that, right? Like we have a hard time believing that God would forgive us for everything that we've done that goes against what he has for us. And maybe you're sitting here today and you've got something that's a part of your past and it's just so bad. And maybe you've been holding on to it for so long that it's just hard for you to believe that God can forgive you of that particular thing. In fact, I came across a survey this past week that said 22% of American men and 33% of American women depend on Jesus to overcome sin. So what that means is, is that there are a lot of people out there that are coming up with these other creative ways to try to make themselves right with God. So I want to make sure you understand, you don't have to get creative. You don't have to find other ways to make yourself right with God. He offers forgiveness for your sins. Look at what Paul says. He says, in him we have redemption or freedom. That's really what that word means. That's just a fancy word to mean freedom. In Jesus we have freedom through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. So Paul says that it's through the blood of Jesus that we're forgiven. So this is good news today, right? You can be forgiven. You can depend on Jesus to overcome your sin. Now I think was, as we look in the New Testament, I think we we find this pattern that kind of develops on receiving forgiveness. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that this morning. What are some of the things we need to do to receive this forgiveness that God has for us? And I think the first step is we need to make a confession. If we really want to be forgiven for our sins, then I think we need to make this confession. We need to tell God what it is that we need to be forgiven for. In fact, look at what John says in the New Testament, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So what John says there is that if we admit our sin, if we confess our sin, then, then God will let our sins go and he'll clean up all the guilt that we might be feeling because of what we've done. And so we've got to make this confession. Now, let's just be honest with one another and acknowledge right up front that confessing can be really hard sometimes, right? Because if you're going to confess... There are times when you have to look into a really dark place maybe in your heart. And so there can be a lot of pain there. It, 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 can, it, it can hurt to make this confession. I mean, who wants to go to God and admit, this is what I've done that I shouldn't have done? 
And so sometimes it's hard to make that confession because there's that pain there and it hurts. About 20 years ago, I was out at St. Chris Lake, you know, not too far from here, and I fell. And when I went down, I went down hard. And I ended up wrecking my ankle. I broke my ankle in three different places. I dislocated my foot. And when I dislocated my foot, I put so much pressure on my leg that I broke the fibula right, right about there, right below my knee. And I'm going to spare you the gory details other than to say when I dislocated my foot, it was no longer pointing in the right direction. All right? And I, I didn't want to look at it because of all the pain that was, that was going on down there. I knew it wasn't right. I could tell that it wasn't right. But I didn't want to look at it. And I never did look at it. But I remember we, I, I got into the ER and the orthopedic surgeon came in and said, yeah, you're going to have to have surgery on all that. And he said, but the first thing we have to do is we got to get your foot kind of going back in the right direction. And so I asked him, I said, is that going to hurt? And he just turned around and walked out. He didn't even answer the question. And about 15 minutes later, that same surgeon came in with three other guys. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to hurt, all right? It hurt. That's all I'm going to say, all right? And so I ended up having surgery. They put pins in my ankle. And now I have scars on both sides of my ankle that tell a pretty good story, right? Now, listen, sometimes it's hard to make a confession because it hurts. There's pain that's there. You have to look in a part of your heart that maybe you don't want to look at, and that pain may last for a while, right? And so sometimes it's difficult to admit that your soul is pointing in the wrong direction. But if you'll make this confession, I've got good news for you because here's what will happen, all right? The great physician will come in and he'll start to do some surgery. He'll start working on your heart and he'll go in there and he'll take out the stuff that's not supposed to be in there and he'll clean up all the guilt. And in the end, you'll have these scars that will tell a pretty good story of his forgiveness and grace working in your life. I mean, that's what you end up with if you're willing to face the pain, right? If you're willing to go through the painful process of making this confession, looking where you don't want to look because your soul's pointed in the wrong direction, what ends up happening is you have these scars that tell the best parts of your story. Now, I want to make sure you hear this, all right? Let me say this, then we're going to move on. I don't want you to go home here in a little bit and say, the preacher said that I should sin more so that I've got a good story to tell. <laughs> because that's not what I'm saying. You don't need to try to sin more, okay? We're doing pretty good on our own, right? But when you sin, when you've got that dark place in your heart, even when it's painful, even when it's going to hurt, go to God and make that confession and admit that your soul is headed in the wrong direction and let him work on your heart and let that scar be a part of your story of what God is doing in your life. Just tell him about it. And so I think that's the first step that we need to take as we receive forgiveness. We need to make a confession. Secondly, we need to be willing to repent. When you take a look at your soul and you discover that it's pointing in the wrong direction, even when it hurts, right, even when it's painful, you've got to make that confession like we just talked about. You go to God and you tell him what it is that's going on, and so you let him do surgery in there, and then you repent so that your soul is pointing back in the right direction. You see, friends, here's what we have to understand. When we sin... It's no longer about what God wants, it's about what we want. It's no longer about His way, it's about our way now, right? Because His way is never sin. And so when we sin, we're, we're turning away, our, our soul is pointing in the wrong direction. And so what we have to do is we have to be willing to repent. And when we repent, that's just a fancy word that means to make a U-turn. We realize that our soul's pointing in the wrong direction and we want to make this change. It's no longer going to be about me, but now I want it to be about him. And so I want to change, right? I want my soul pointing in the right direction toward him and not toward something else that I've done. Not toward something that I want. I want my soul pointed toward what he wants. Look at what the Lord says through the prophet Isaiah. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord. That's the direction that our soul should be pointing. In Acts chapter 3, Peter says, repent then and turn to God. That's the direction that our soul should be pointing. Turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You see, friends, the goal of repentance is not to make you feel bad. The goal of repentance isn't even to make you feel guilty. The goal of repentance is for you to know that you can turn it around, right? Like that you can realize that your soul is pointing in the wrong direction. 
And so when you sin, whatever it is that you've done that's a part of your past that's got your soul pointing in the wrong direction, and maybe you just believe there's no way that God could ever forgive you, I want you to know that you can always go back. You can always get right with God. You can turn from your wicked ways. You can turn from your terrible thoughts, and you can turn to the Lord. You can turn to God. And I love what Peter tells us there in Acts 3. What does he say? When you turn to God, what does Peter say God will do? He says he'll wipe out your sins. In other words, you get to start over. You get to start over. And when that happens, you discover that God always, right? He always has a much better way for you than you could ever discover on your own. And so we need to make a confession. We need to admit that our soul is headed in the wrong direction, even when it's painful. Then we need to be willing to repent. We need to make a U-turn and get our soul pointing back in the right direction. And then if we want to receive forgiveness, we need to rely on the advocate. If we want to receive forgiveness, then we need to rely on the advocate. Look at what John says in the New Testament. He says, if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so John says that we have this advocate and his name is Jesus. So what does that mean? I mean, what exactly does it mean to have an advocate? You know, I love the word that John uses here in the original language that's translated in our English as advocate, because if you take a look at that word, the word that he uses there, it, it literally means like one who's pleading the case of another before a judge. And so understand what John is saying here, okay? I mean, can, let me just kind of spell it out for you in, in plain English. What, what John is saying here is saying, look, while we're down here sinning, Jesus is up there pleading our case before the Father. He's our defense attorney. He's speaking on our behalf. And now he's defending us. That's what it means to have this advocate in, in Jesus. And so here's what you need to understand, friends. Jesus gave his life for you. And I don't want this to just be another opportunity for you to hear this, right? Like, I don't want you to sit here this morning and be like, yeah, okay, I've heard this, you know, over the last eight or nine Sundays, you've said something along those lines. I mean, I want you to take a moment and just let it sink in. Jesus died for no other reason but for you. The Father sent His Son, and His Son came and lived this perfect life, ultimately to give his life for you. And let's make sure we understand, he did that willingly, right? Like nobody forced him to give his life. Nobody forced him to go to the cross. He willingly laid himself down on the cross. I mean, he's the son of God. He could have stopped it at any moment if he wanted to. I mean, he gave blind people their sight back. He gave deaf people their hearing back. He healed the sick. He raised dead people back to life. He could cast out demons with one word. He had control over the weather. He could have stopped it if he wanted to, so nobody forced him to give his life. He did it willingly for you, the one whose body was broken for you, the one who shed his blood for you, the one who gave his life for you. He's now defending you. He's defending you, and so here's what this means. I want you to think of it this way. This, this is the implications of this. I, I, I love to think of it like this, all right? While the confession and the scars tell the best parts of your story, and while repentance tells the best parts of your story, Jesus is up there defending you from the worst parts of your story. And while it may be painful, and while it may hurt for a while, the most painful part of the process has already been taken care of by Jesus on the cross. He took the nails for you. He took the crown of thorns for you. He took the sword in his side for you. And he gave his life to pay for your debts, past, present, and future. And so you can depend on him. You can depend on him. And I want you to hear these words, right? Like if you walk out with, with nothing else today, I hope you walk out with more than just this. But if there's one thing I want you to walk out of here today, I want you to walk out with these words in mind. You are forgiven in the name of the Father by the blood of the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
you are forgiven. And whatever it is you might be sitting here today and you've been holding on to it, maybe for a few moments or maybe for a few hours or a few weeks, a few months, or maybe even for years and years, and you just believe that God cannot forgive you for that, I want you to know he can and he will. And so here's what I want you to do. There on the back of your bulletin in the outline, I should have these words with a blank. And so what I want you to do, I want you to do this right now. I want you to grab a pen. I want you to write your name in that blank. Just personalize it this morning. Brad Ferris, you, your name, you are forgiven. In the name of the Father, by the blood of the Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Receive his forgiveness. And so Jesus prays, forgive us our debts. But then he goes on, doesn't he? He didn't stop there. He says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And so Jesus is not only talking about receiving forgiveness, but he's also talking about how we need to give forgiveness. I mean, I think Jesus makes it pretty clear here in his prayer, wherever forgiveness is received, forgiveness must be given. In fact, it's a point that we find throughout his word. And just like receiving forgiveness can be hard at times, giving forgiveness can be difficult as well, right? My wife, Marianne, and I, we were talking about this uh, yesterday. I was telling her that we're going to continue on with the Lord's Prayer. And and I told her, I said, we're going to be talking about Uh, receiving forgiveness and giving forgiveness. And she said, oh, she said, I'm so thankful that I get forgiveness. It's really hard to give it. And she's right. This can be difficult because when somebody does something that hurts us, right? Like when somebody does something that makes us angry, when somebody does something that mistreats us, when somebody does something that's unfair to us or they say something that just really cuts to our heart, you know, like they... They just say something that's not very nice about us at all. We, we, we feel this anger and we have this bitterness and we, we want to hold a grudge and, we, and, and maybe at times we want to seek revenge, right, <laughs> rather than give forgiveness. You know, there are times I get offended way too easily. In fact, sometimes I, I, I get offended in the Walmart parking lot sometimes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how this plays out. Maybe you can relate with me on this, Okay. But I'll be driving in front of the building looking for a parking space. Like all the parking aisles will be on my left. And I'll be driving looking for a parking space. And there'll be a space right, like the very first space of a row. And it never never fails that it's always in a row where if I were to turn into that aisle, I'm going to be going the wrong way. You know what I'm talking about? So if I turn, I've got to make like kind of this loop. To, to, because I'm going the wrong way, to kind of get headed in the right direction to make the right angle so that I can get into the parking space. You following me? Now, I'm a rule follower. And so what I will do is I will pass that parking spot right there at the front, and I will go to the next aisle, and I'll turn left, and I'll go all the way up that aisle going the right way, get to the end of that aisle, make a left-hand turn so that I'm coming down the aisle going the right way so that I can just pull right into that parking spot, right? And it never, ever fails. You know what's coming, right? I'll go up that aisle, and I'll make a left, and I'll come down the aisle, and right before I get to where I can turn in that parking space, here comes somebody, turns going up the wrong way, kind of makes that loop and snatches that parking spot right out from under me. And I tell you what, it makes me so makes me so angry sometimes happened to me the other day i'm in the walmart parking lot i see a spot right across from the door where you go in and it's if i turn and get that spot right there i'm going to be going the wrong way so i go to the next aisle i go up that aisle i make the turn i come down that aisle and right before i pull in here comes a guy makes this wide kind of loop gets headed in the right direction pulls and snatches it right out from my grasp and i was so angry i just sat there I waited for this guy to get out of the car. I honked. I shook my finger at him. And the guy turned around, and it was Andy Conklin. <laughs> probably, probably going in to get his juice boxes or something like that. I don't, I don't. Okay, so I just made all that part up, right? But here's my point. My point is, is that we always have these opportunities to extend forgiveness, even in the Walmart parking lot. And just like giving for, or just like receiving forgiveness, I think there's this pattern we find in the New Testament when it comes to forgiving forgiveness as well. The first thing we have to do is we have to make the decision. We just have to decide that we're going to forgive. In Matthew 18, there's this really well-known interaction between Jesus and his disciples 
where Jesus kind of lays out how you resolve a conflict between two people. By the way, there's a biblical way to resolve a conflict that you have with somebody else. Jesus spells it right out for us. But after this conflict, Peter speaks up. And I want you to see what, what Peter says. Look at this. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Now, we've talked about this before, but just as a reminder to make sure that we all understand the implications of what's happening here culturally. Back in Jesus' day, the religious teachers taught that if somebody did something against you, you were to forgive them up to three times, and then you're off the hook. And so when Peter comes to Jesus and says, if somebody sins against me, how many times should I forgive him? Should I forgive him seven times? He's kind of going beyond what the religious teachers, what the expectation was of his day, right? So he kind of goes beyond that, the three times. Now, when Jesus answers Peter, he raises the bar. Jesus always raises the bar, doesn't he? Look at what Jesus says to Peter. He says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, here's the point that Jesus is making. When someone offends you, when someone makes you angry, when someone steals your parking spot, whatever it is, right, and you have an opportunity to forgive, you just make the decision to forgive, Jesus' point here is you don't keep track. You don't count. You just forgive. And so maybe somebody does something to you and you decide today, you know what, I'm going to forgive that person. And then you get up in the morning and all those emotions start to come back. You've got to make the decision tomorrow. I'm going to forgive that person. And then maybe... On Wednesday, uh, you got to make the decision. I'm going to forgive that person. And you just make the decision over and over and over as much as you need to make the decision that you're going to extend forgiveness. I mean, it's this expectation, right, as Jesus followers that we're going to do this. Jesus even puts the expectation in his prayer there in Matthew chapter 6. What does he say? Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You hear the expectation? Look what Paul says because he's pretty clear here. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's pretty clear. Paul says, you got to get rid of all that stuff. Get rid of the anger, get rid of the bitterness, get rid of the rage, get rid of the brawling, get rid of the slander, and choose to forgive. Just decide to forgive. In Colossians 3, Paul goes on to say, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievances against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Friends, give up the urge to hold a grudge and just make the decision today, right here, right now, to just give forgiveness. Let go of all the bitterness and the rage and the anger and just decide to forgive. And so you got to make the decision. Secondly, when we give forgiveness, we can be a blessing. We need to be a blessing, and I'm just going to give you a heads up here, okay? As hard as it is sometimes to make the decision to forgive, being a blessing to somebody who's hurt you, that's really hard. But look at what Peter says, and I'm going to give you a warning here. This is difficult. He says, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Now, look at this. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. told you it was going to be hard. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, in other words, that's kind of Peter's way of saying, you be different since you follow Jesus. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but be a blessing. That's tough. You know, I think a lot of times our natural tendency when somebody makes us angry, when somebody hurts us in some way, our natural tendency is to repay evil with evil. You know, I'm going to change the phrasing on that because I don't want to speak for you, so I'm going to speak for myself. When somebody hurts me, when somebody makes me angry, my natural tendency is to repay evil with evil, insult with insult. And if I'm really honest with you, my natural tendency a lot of times is to kind of one-up them. I'm just going to hurt them a little more than they hurt me. 
Now, that's my natural tendency. On the contrary, because I follow Jesus, I want to be different. I mean, you don't have to look in the world very hard and very long to see how this plays out, right? You've got this person that offends this person, and then this person decides that they're going to offend that person, and they're going to do it just a little bit just a little bit worse, right? Like they're just going to escalate the conflict just a little bit more and a little bit more. I mean, we kind of see this played on social media sometimes. In fact, it's a big reason why I don't do much on social media anymore because this person offends this person and then this person offends this person and it just escalates and escalates and escalates and it just turns into this never-ending cycle. Friends, listen. There's nothing productive that comes from holding a grudge. There's nothing productive that comes from seeking revenge. There's nothing productive that comes from unforgiveness in your life. It just wastes your time and it wastes your energy. And so I think it causes us to ask this question this morning. I think we've got to be honest as we ask this question, is there any unforgiveness that you have in your life right now? And maybe you've had some unforgiveness towards someone for so long that you've just learned to live with it. You've kind of become comfortable with it. Friends, I want you to know that today you can be set free. You don't have to live with it because, listen, when you give forgiveness, it really doesn't benefit the other person as much as it benefits you. What did Peter say again? Look at this. He says, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. So Peter's talking about loving others here. This is the context of loving others. And the greatest challenge to our love for others comes when somebody hurts us. when somebody sins against us. And so Peter says to forgive and to be a blessing so that you'll inherit a blessing. Here's what Jesus says. He says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? So understand what Jesus is saying here in in the culture. What Jesus is saying here is saying, look, If you just love the people who love you, you're no better than the people who are cheating you out of your money when they collect your taxes. You're no better than the people that you already hate. If all you do is love the people who love you, Jesus goes on. He says, and if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? So Jesus says, there's no credit to us when we love the people who love us. The greatest test of our love comes when we love our enemies and we bless them. Because think about this for a second, all right? And then we're going to move on and I'm going to close. When you hold a grudge, like when you have all of this anger and this bitterness and this rage and you're holding a grudge and you want to seek revenge, you're letting the past dictate the present. Your past is dictating your present. And listen, listen, I don't want your past to dictate your present. I want Jesus to dictate your present. And he says to love our enemies and bless them. One last thing. If we want to give forgiveness, don't delay. Don't delay in giving forgiveness. I want you to look at what Jesus says, and I'm going to end here pretty quickly. He says, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. So I want you to hear what Jesus says here. He says it's far more important to go and be reconciled to someone else than it is to do a religious duty. And so he says, if you're at the altar and you're giving your gift and you realize that there's something going on with you and somebody else, he says, you leave your, you, you leave your gift there and you go and take care of this right now and then come back and do what you need to do. And so as we've been talking about this, as we've been talking about unforgiveness, there may be the name of somebody that's coming up in your mind. Like, you you know who that is, right? Like, you know if there's somebody that you need to extend forgiveness to, you need to give forgiveness. Maybe you've been holding on to this anger and this rage and this bitterness and and this this grudge and, and, and wanting to get revenge. Maybe you've been holding on to that even for a long time, right? Don't delay. I mean, I would even encourage you to leave here this morning when we're done and go straight to who that person is. I know that for some of you, it's your religious duty to go to the lighthouse and eat after this service. And I'm asking you 
before you go eat at the lighthouse. You go knock on somebody's door if that's what you need to do. And extend forgiveness. Make it right. And so I want to encourage you to do a couple of things this morning. We're going to sing a song together here in just a moment. And while we're singing, maybe there is something in your heart and you need to make a confession this morning in this deep, dark, shame-filled place in your heart. And it, it's going to be painful. It's going to hurt to admit that your soul is pointed in the wrong direction. But maybe while we're singing, you just need to go to God and say, God, this is what I've done. And I want your forgiveness. And let that scar, let that surgery take place and let that scar tell the best part of your story of what God is doing in your heart and in your life through his forgiveness and his grace. And maybe there's someone that you need to go to this morning and, and extend that forgiveness. Or maybe you just need to make the decision here this morning, you know what, I'm laying it down. I'm walking away from it. Do that while we sing. Now, you can do all that right where, we're, right where you'll be standing, but we also are going to have folks over here in our prayer room, and you just may need some extra help. You may just want to sit down and talk to somebody. This is what I've been holding on to for so long in my relationship with God or in my relationship with somebody else, and I just need some help today. They would love to just spend some time talking with you and just praying with you about that. And so while we sing, you can go to our prayer rooms right here to my right up front here, and they'll spend some time this morning just listening and then just praying with you and for you. This is all about tearing down walls. I want some walls to be torn down today. I want some walls to be torn down in our relationship with God and in our relationships with others. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father, that he willingly went to the cross. And we are grateful that he took the nails, that he took the crown, that he took the sword to pay for our debts, past, present, and future. And we thank you, Father, for the forgiveness that we find in his blood. And Father, there may be some of us sitting here this morning and we we realize today that our soul is pointed in the wrong direction. Father, I pray that we have the courage to face that pain, to face the hurt that's there, and to make this confession this morning. To repent. To make the U-turn and to get our soul pointing back in the right direction to leave whatever it is that we're doing because we want it and to live the way that you want us to live. So, Father, if there's, if there's a wall this morning between us and you, may that wall be torn down today by your forgiveness and your grace. And, Father, if there's a wall that exists between us and someone else, I pray that that wall is torn down today as well. I pray, Father, that today we make this decision to just extend forgiveness. I pray, Father, that we live these contrary lives, that we're different because we follow Jesus, and that we're a blessing to those who even hurt us. And I pray, Father, that we, that we wouldn't delay. we need to put something down this morning or if we need to go to someone else that we would just be willing to do it right right now we thank you father for the freedom that we find in jesus for the freedom that we find in his blood the freedom from our sin the forgiveness and grace As we receive that, Father, may we give that. Father, forgive us our debts. As we also have forgiven our debtors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.